Hey there, welcome back to Pepper Geek. In today's video, I'll be experimenting in making our very first fermented cayenne pepper sauce. So we've never really made a true buffalo style fermented cayenne pepper sauce, but this year we have a ton of cayenne peppers. We grew seven different varieties and taste tested them all in a previous video. So we're using some of those peppers by experimenting with fermentation. If you didn't know, Louisiana style hot sauce is made up of fermented cayenne peppers with some vinegar and some garlic powder and some salt. And that's really it. That's sort of the base point for making a really good buffalo style sauce. So throughout this video, I'll be showing you exactly what we've done to get here today with our final hot sauce, all of the different steps that we took and the mistakes that I think I made along the way. And we're looking for your feedback because we wanna make more cayenne pepper sauce and we wanna refine it and make it better and make a delicious, amazing recipe to share back with you in the end. But this is our starting point. It's pretty good, it looks amazing. The flavor and aroma is there. Okay, so let's go back to when I first started making the sauce. So let me go through the entire process that we're gonna cover in this video and we'll start with fermentation. So we're gonna start by fermenting these peppers in a brine fermentation. So essentially we're gonna rough chop them and put them in a salt water solution and let them sit for an extended period of time. That will initiate the fermentation process and we'll check back in when the ferment has reached a pH of around four. After that, I'll drain the brine away blend the peppers up and combine them with some white vinegar along with a little bit of garlic powder. And then we're gonna start the process of emulsifying, basically stir it often and frequently for a few days to combine those liquids along with the peppers and then strain all of that into our final hot sauce. Okay, so with the process laid out, let's start by fermenting our peppers. Like I said, I'm gonna use a brine fermentation and this is just some dechlorinated water. You'll also need a vessel to carry out the fermentation. I'm just using this ball jar. It's a pretty large one because we have a lot of peppers. Now this is optional, but this is a self burping lid that fits right on top of a ball jar. And basically when carbon dioxide is released during the fermentation process, and pressure builds up, this will allow that pressure to release. If you use a normal ball jar lid, you're gonna have to burp it. So this just makes it a lot easier. I'll leave a link down below where you can get these if you want. And lastly, of course, you're gonna need your peppers. So these are all different red cayenne varieties and they're all gonna serve the same purpose. Fresh produce, do not use frozen only. Although you can incorporate frozen peppers into your ferments, you need some fresh produce to make it work best. All right, so it's really simple. I'll just show you a little bit of this because uh, I have a lot of peppers to cut, but essentially you just take off the stems and rough chop them into circles. One other thing to do at this point is to keep an eye out for any signs of rot or mold and discard those peppers, get them far away from your ferment. And I'll just add them as I go, like so. So what I did for the water is I weighed out the water. It was just over 2000 grams and I went for a 3% brine, so 3% salt into the water by weight, which came out to about 62 grams of salt. Okay, so those peppers basically perfectly filled this jar up. Basically, you'll see we have a little bit of room up top and we're gonna pour the salt water into these peppers and fill it just above the peppers. And I'll leave a little bit of room there. And at this point, you wanna sort of allow it to sit for a little while and some of the air that's trapped currently will release. You can carefully hit it from the bottom and that really seems to work really well. See lots of air bubbles. You wanna do your best right now before you seal it up to get as many of those air pockets free. So you can see the level of the brine has dropped probably an inch since we added it in uh, just from air releasing. So now we can top it off. You do wanna leave a little bit of space you don't want it to be pressed right up against your lid. If you're using an airlock and the water comes in contact with the airlock, the pressure can actually push water out instead of pushing the air out, you'll have a big mess. So make sure you leave at least a half an inch of headspace. So with that, you just wanna seal it up using an airlock or anything that will release the pressure for you. Seal it up nice. And then of course, label it with the start date. So I'm gonna to put today's date, which is 831. And that's all, I'm gonna get this into a room temperature place out of direct sunlight. A closet is a good place, but you want it to be room temperature. The warmer it is, the faster the fermentation is going to begin and take place. Okay, so two days later, and this is on top of our refrigerator. The first thing is you should put your vessel into a tray of some sort to catch any liquid that may escape. You can see lots and lots of bubbles popping up uh, as fermentation occurs 
and carbon dioxide is produced, that gas needs to escape. You can see as the gas escapes from the top here, there are bubbles forming, that's coming out of the vent, and that's a good thing. Uh, but it also means some of the liquid is getting released, so I may have to top this off. By the way, at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, your activity is gonna be much higher than, say, at 68 or lower. Uh, the higher the temperature, again, the quicker the fermentation is gonna take place. If I kind of tap this, you can really see it, hopefully. Yeah, lots and lots of activity going on there. Tons of CO2 bubbles, and that is a great thing. I can actually smell it. Uh, it smells delicious, so we'll come back in a bit when this is done fermenting. Okay, so we're back just four days later. That is record time for me, uh, and the reason was this was in a very warm location. I put it above our refrigerator where the temperatures were reaching the mid 80s Fahrenheit, and that's a little too warm. And as a result, we had some interesting things happen with our ferment. And the most notable was that the brine became sort of viscous. Thankfully, this really isn't anything to worry about, although it is unsightly and kind of gross to some people. It's just caused by a bacteria that is harmless, but thrives in those warmer temperatures, or it can also happen if you leave your ferment in a place that's too cold. The ideal range is right around 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Just a few degrees above or below is fine, but 85 degrees Fahrenheit is a little bit too warm. But either way, this ferment is now below three pH, so it's extremely acidic. It smells fine. Remember that smell is your best indicator of whether or not your ferment has gone bad. This has been strained out, and we're left with just the pepper, so the brine has been strained away. We just have the fermented peppers now, and I basically want to blend this down so that it's almost a liquid. Okay, so as you can see, the volume has reduced significantly by blending it down and getting rid of all of that air. Now we can see we're left with just about four cups of the ferment. And so we're gonna add just about eight cups of white vinegar, and I'm gonna use this larger vessel to do so. Four cups of vinegar going in. And the last ingredient we can add at this point is some dried garlic powder. And I'm just gonna add about a tablespoon and a half to this batch. Now the immersion blender is kind of a perfect tool here. You can bring it wherever you need it and get it right to the bottom where it will mix everything together from the bottom. It sort of creates this vortex of suction and everything gets blended evenly. So now under ideal circumstances, you would constantly stir this for 24 to 48 hours or even longer, but I'm just gonna come back periodically two, three times a day and do what I just did for two or three minutes at a time. And over those days, the flavor will infuse into the vinegar and then eventually we'll strain it off and bottle the hot sauce. So let's jump ahead to when this is ready to go into the bottles. Okay, so just over three weeks later and I'm ready to bottle the hot sauce. Today I will be stirring it one final time to recombine the ingredients, filtering it through a fine mesh strainer, and then finally bottling the sauce. So there it is, it's a beautiful color when it's all combined together. The next step is to carefully pour this through a fine mesh strainer. Get the sturdiest and finest strainer you can. You can also use a food mill if you have one. Those are really useful for just sort of hand cranking it and you don't have to worry about scraping it down and getting rid of the pulp. But I'm gonna do it the old fashioned way here with my fine mesh strainer. Okay, so last and certainly not least, it's time to actually bottle. And I'm using this funnel here, which actually has another strainer. In she goes. And now finally, I have my tasting spoon, so I'm gonna give this a taste for the first time. Cheers. The texture of that is wonderful. The heat level is relatively mild, believe it or not. I think there's more bite from the vinegar, but you get a bit of that fermented flavor. You get the white vinegar, which gives you that sort of zing in the back of the throat. 
So this was definitely an experiment and I think the improvements that we could have made here are we could have reduced the amount of vinegar used. I think I just went a little too heavy on the vinegar, two parts vinegar to one part pepper mash by volume. I think that was a little too much vinegar. Based on the flavor, I would probably reduce that to around one and a half parts vinegar or maybe even one and a third or one and a quarter. I don't know. What do you think? Have you experimented with vinegar quantity for your Louisiana style sauces? We want to know. Another adjustment I would make is to add more garlic powder for this volume. The garlic flavor is definitely there, but it's sort of minor. It's more of an undertone. It's definitely not very upfront and it leaves me wanting a little bit more garlic flavor. So of course that's a really easy fix. And the last tweak I would definitely make is kick up the heat. This really doesn't have that much heat at least for my standards. More of the punch of this sauce comes from the actual vinegar. You get that sort of back of the throat tang that you get from vinegar. It's really acidic. And one last thing I would do differently is ferment at the proper temperature range. This was fermented far too warm. It was above our refrigerator again, and it just fermented way too quickly. And we ended up with that sort of gloopiness to the brine. Next time we are definitely going to keep it at 70 degrees or even a little below 70 degrees so that the fermentation is a bit slower. But again, I think this is a pretty good starting point. I'm not terribly disappointed in it. It looks amazing, it smells amazing, and it tastes pretty good. It's just a little bit underwhelming. It doesn't really just smack you across the face with flavor, and that's kind of what I wanna get out of my cayenne sauce. So leave your comments below, share your feedback. If you've made a really good cayenne pepper sauce, let us know what we did wrong and what we should try doing in our next attempt. Thanks so much for watching Pepper Geek, and I'll see you next time.